Hanson family. Merry Christmas. Glad three of you are excited about Christmas. Um, I, I want to start, I, I didn't mention this first service, but I, I do want to mention um, just and ask that we as a church family continue to keep our community in prayers over the uh, tragic events that unfolded this week and, and the lives of all that were involved in, in that will never be the same. And, um, and there will be a lot of grieving families this Christmas season and, um, and just what a tragic event. And so we just pray for unity and peace in our community um, as we pray for the families of the officers who have lost their lives and, and just the, the world that we live in and the, and the brokenness and the hurting that's going on. And so, um, so anyway, I just wanted to encourage us to do that and acknowledge that. I'm excited to be here this morning to, to be speaking, and um, I've had a lot of time to prepare for this message. It's, uh, it's really one that I didn't realize that I'd been thinking about for a, uh, quite a long time, and so um, I'm going to start by just sharing a story with you. My, my wife is not here today because um, this story is embarrassing to her, and she did not want to come this morning because uh, she didn't want people looking at her, which gives me the freedom to um, really go uh, into detail with the story since she's not going to be here to... Uh, <laughs> To be to be stared at, but um, a couple years ago, my kids got. Um, we have a Wii gaming console at home, and then uh, the kids um, got one of the Just Dance uh, games. And so I don't know how familiar you are with it, but the way the game works is there's um, there's these avatars on the TV, these little characters, and they're they're dancing to. Um, a song, and then you hold the controller, and you have to dance. This is about as good as I dance, by the way. You have to dance, use it, moving the controller, and the closer you are to the movements, the more points you score, and you can compete against one another, and and everything. And so my kids uh, got this thing as a Christmas present from their their uncle Mike, and um, so. I don't know, it was a couple of weeks after Christmas, it was snowing or rainy or whatever, for whatever reason, it was cold outside and there was nothing to do, so we had the Wii console hooked up to the big TV downstairs and everybody's playing um, this game and um, one of the songs that they were playing is a song called uh, Move Like Jagger, I believe it's, I, I believe it's by Maroon 5, I'm not sure, but um, it is by Maroon 5, that's actually, I am sure about that. So, um, Anyway, so they were playing the song, and they were dancing to the song. It's the radio version. It's not a Christian song. It's a secular song. That's not the point. The point is, is that my, my wife and my kids were dancing and competing to this song. Now, I sing better than I dance, and I sing like a wild turkey, okay? So I have no dancing ability whatsoever, okay? I, I look like I've been electrocuted by an outlet when I'm trying to dance like I got no no rhythm no nothing my wife on the other hand is an incredible dancer she is really good at dancing and so and she's competitive and so she and the kids are competing to this song and I'm sitting there watching it and I realize in that moment how incredibly attractive and how much I love watching my wife dance like I, I love it I love watching my wife dance I think she's attractive when she's dancing that embarrasses her for me to share that, but I just want you to know that I'm not embarrassed by that. I love it. And ever since that moment, when I hear that song, I think about my wife dancing to that song. So a few months ago, I started riding my bike regularly three or four times a week, and I would go out and ride for 30 minutes to an hour, and I listened to a particular um, channel on my, on my Pandora, and for whatever reason, that song seems to be part of the playlist, and it comes on almost every single time I go biking. And so every time I hear that song, I think about Katie dancing. And so this one particular day, I was thinking about that as I'm riding, and I was thinking about Katie dancing, and I was thinking about how, and I was actually beginning to pray and give thanks to the Lord for my wife, and, and the fact that after 15 years of marriage, we still find each other attractive, and we still have a... Um, a passion for one another, and I got to thinking about love and passion. Some of y'all are getting uncomfortable. It's okay. I mean, God created love and passion. We can talk about it. Um, but I was thinking about how God gave us that, and I was thinking about um, the song and the lyrics, and I was thinking about other love songs, and I was thinking about the extent, particularly in, from a man's perspective, the extent that as a man, the things that we will go to, the lengths that we will go to, the things that we'll be willing to do to woo um, 
the, the woman of our desire, right? And so and I was kind of thinking about all that. And I was, I was praying and I was, I was giving the thanks to the Lord for that. And I was kind of thinking through love. And it occurred to me in that moment that God says about himself that God is love. That, that God created love. God created love. He created passion. He created intimacy. He created romance. He created all of those things. And then it occurred to me that if we're created, if God is love and we're created in the image of God, then we are created to love. It is one of our primal instincts. It is one of the, our motivating instincts, right? In, in fact, it will compel us to do things that are beyond logic and reason. And not only are we created to love, but we are created to be loved. And so if you'll just stick with me for a second, I want to kind of build upon this a little bit and, and, and make my case. Okay? So we know that we are created to love and created to be loved. And we also know that love, when we love, when we engage in love and passion and intimacy, that it changes us. It changes us physically, it changes us psychologically, and it changes us emotionally. Let me give you an example. When I was going through life skills training several years ago, Paul Hedgecombe, the, the developer of life skills, um, used a phrase when he was talking about attraction. He was talking about the gift of attraction. And he was talking about the, the physical things that happen to our body when we see someone that we're attracted to. And that that, that is a gift from God. And so he's giving some examples of some physical things that happen. Like we know that when we see someone we're attracted to, that it increases our heart rate. We know that it can increase our breathing rate. We know that, that it causes our pupils to dilate so that we can take in more of what we are seeing. That there are literally physical things that happen to our body through that gift of attraction goes on to talk about the psychological and physiological things that happen to our bodies as we begin to go deeper in love and passion and intimacy we begin to do things unconsciously like we begin to associate sounds and smells and memories connected to that person like we begin to remember what they're like when we smell their perfume or their cologne we immediately recognize that or we'll associate um, maybe a song with that person and so maybe maybe that was a song that was on the radio the first time that we met or maybe it was a song on the radio or a song that was playing the first time we said we loved one another or something but we will we will associate those kind of things in our minds we also know that, that even the simple act of holding hands, we begin to develop pathways in our brains back and forth between the two hemispheres that allow us to access memories and emotions that are connected to that person. And the, and the deeper we go in love and intimacy, the stronger and the more those pathways develop. We even begin to invest emotionally. We begin to, um, for men in particular, I'm sure that women do that. I'm, I'm not an authority to speak on a woman's mind. Um, I have three that live in my house, and I do good to tell you what they're thinking at any given time. Um, there's a couple of thoughts and looks that they give me that I just instinctively know what those mean, but for the most part, I, I'm, I claim to, to know very little about a woman's mind, so I'm purely speaking from a man's perspective. But I know that for men, when we want to impress, when we want to put ourselves out there, when we want to, we want to prove that we're worthy of her heart, we will begin to do things and invest emotionally, um, even simple things like we want, to, we want to put on our best, and we want, to, we want to dress nice to impress. Maybe we want to make sure that that, we, that she understands that we have a good job or that we can provide. Maybe we, 
we have a nice car, maybe we, maybe we clean our house or our apartment in a way that we normally wouldn't do. But we begin to, we begin to do things that emotionally to make sure that, that we are at least um, in the running and bidding for her attention. We begin to share maybe stories about ourselves or we begin to share characteristics or vulnerabilities about ourselves to, to again, to reinforce and present the idea that, that we are worthy to be her knight in shining armor. We begin to do other things to show that we care, like maybe we, we give flowers or we give jewelry or we write a card, send a card or write a poem or a love letter. But there are clearly things that we do as humans to convey attraction and love and desire and intimacy. And we instinctively know how to do these even from a young age. I'll, I'll give you some examples. Be it immaturely, I'll give you some examples. So I, I can remember being in elementary school and having a crush on a little girl and writing the sweetest most romantic, will you go with me? Check yes or no. All right. How many of you are old enough to remember doing some of y'all? All right, cool. Last service, there were several people, but they all went like this, like nobody really wanted to admit it, so I appreciate you guys being honest that you did that. How many of you received those letters? Maybe a couple of you, yeah, yeah. All right, and I remember writing that letter and giving it to my, my buddy Johnny and going, hey, make sure you tell her how amazing I am, right? Like, he's, you're my wingman, you got this, right? Or how about in junior high, I remember being in junior high and we could, um, at Valentine's, we could buy carnations to, to send and give to someone that we liked. We could send a white carnation that says, I like you. We could send a pink carnation that says, I have a crush on you. We could send a red carnation that said, I love you. And I can remember making sure to save my allowance so, you know, because you don't want to just send one because what if, what if somebody else is competing for her uh, affection? So I want to make sure that, you know, I one up whatever, whatever guy is in the running, right? So you buy these carnations to send. Right? You want to be, you want to be impressive. You sit around all your buddies patting yourself on the chest because I sent six or 12 or whatever that looks like. And as I got older, and a little more wise in my, in my abilities to, uh, to be a player, I began to send like, like you want to buy the biggest heart-shaped Valentine's candy that you can get with a card, right? And you want to you make sure it's the right card with, with everything, right? You want to send the best candy. Or how about you write a love letter confessing that you will never love anybody as much as you love this high school sweetheart, that they're the one and only. You'll never find anybody better. I kept some of those love letters that I wrote years ago, not because it was necessarily emotional attachment to, to some of those, but more so because I remember in high school thinking about how smart I was and how much I knew and how, how much smarter and worldly I was than my parents. And so I held on to those letters so that I could remind myself in my later years just how immature and silly and goofy and little I, I did actually know. But see, you and I, we are wired and created for love and to be loved because we are created in the image of God who says that he is love. And I begin to think about how the creator, the God, who is love, if, if I'm capable of doing these things, how much more perfect and how much better is he at doing these things? And what in my nature mimics him and his characteristics in those ways? And so first I was thinking about the creation story and I was thinking about how God created the garden this this perfect place for you and I and he made Adam and Eve in his image and he placed them in this garden and provided for all of their needs 
and he walked with them and knew them intimately. He spoke to them and was present. He declared that we were the crowning achievement of his creation. I think about stories in Genesis with Abraham in which God declares his commitment and faithfulness to us and offers us the opportunity to go with him by declaring that he will give everything to Abraham that he's promised and that his descendants will outnumber the stars and that he will be our God. Or in Jeremiah where he offers the promise that we will be his people and he will be our God. I think about his ability to give gifts. I think about the promised land and and his commitment to allowing the children of Israel to walk out their promise and, and to give them a land that was flowing with milk and honey. I was thinking about his ability to rescue the princess to, to protect his bride in the story of Exodus as the children of Israel are held in captivity, captivity and God steps in and moves and gives them their freedom and leads them to the promised land and protects them all the way there. That he knows how to provide for his beloved. Just in that one story, we see examples of him. When they were hungry, he gave them manna. When they were thirsty, he gave them water. When they needed protection, he parted seas. That he is a good and faithful provider. He even used wingmen. The Old Testament is full of prophets, of men of God, who were sent to remind the children of Israel of God's faithfulness, of his promises, of his ability, of his unfailing love. that he would never forsake them, that he would never leave them, that he would be faithful to do everything that he said that he would do. He even included in this Old Testament poetry and love letters. I think about the song of, well, I think about Psalms 139, where David says that, that the Lord stalks for us outnumber the grains of sand. And I think about how endearing it is to me and how what woman would not want her lover to, to be so in love with her that, that his thoughts for her never end and never cease. Or how about that he knows every hair on her head and how how intimate and safe and secure we would feel if, if our beloved knew every hair on our head. And God uses this kind of language to describe the love and the intimacy in which he has for you and I. And as if that wasn't enough, right smack dab in the middle of the Old Testament, well, it's not right smack dab, but you get my point, he includes this extremely romantic, passionate, just dripping with passion song of Solomon. In fact, the language was such that, and, and so moving and so passionate that the children of Israel weren't even allowed to read it to a certain age. And as I was preparing for the sermon, I began to read through the Song of Solomon, and I was amazed to, to reread it and think through in this perspective just how, how many of those verses that would made, have made us uncomfortable if I would have read them aloud in here. But I did find a few. Ladies, think about this. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. 
pleasing is the fragrance of your perfume. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young, la- the young women love you. Right out of a passion novel, his left arm is under my head. His right arm embraces me. God writes this incredible, passionate, poetic love story right in the Old Testament. And as you sit and listen to those words, I know, like many, there's this one prevailing thought that just keeps coming up over and over in your mind. And that is, what in the world does this have to do with Christmas? So if you'll give me a minute, I would like to share that thought with you. See, it took over a thousand years for the writers of the Old Testament to pin down the stories and the poetry and the prophetic teachings. That God had been faithful to declare His love and His passion and His ability to provide and give and take care of throughout the entire Old Testament. That for generation after generation, the creator of the universe, the one that breathed life into you and I, was unpacking a love story like no other story. In fact, John as he opens his gospel, is so moved that he says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. God is a faithful pursuer of our hearts. He is our faithful lover. And He desires intimacy with us. And John starts off by reminding us that that God has been faithful to declare and to prove His love to us, to speak to the very nature of our hearts. I distinctly remember meeting Katie for the first time. I had actually stood on this stage and spoke to the youth that night, and I went to meet, it was a blind date, and I went to meet Katie, and I knew almost immediately that something was different about her, that this was, this was the one. And in those first few months of our dating, I did everything that a young man in love would do. I did all the right things. And yes, when I would see her, my, my heart would race, my breathing would increase. I'm sure my pupils looked like I'd been to the doctor and been dilated, right? Like I, <clears throat> I wanted her to know how much I loved her. I couldn't spend enough time with her. I cooked nice dinners for her. We, we went on long walks. We talked. I shared my heart told her about my hopes and my dreams and I listened to hers I wanted to to protect her and to provide for her and so in late May we began to talk about marriage and we realized that that we were both feeling the same way and that this was this was the one for each of us and so we began to talk about marriage and what would happen next but see Katie had planned a trip to go to Europe for a month and was going to be gone and so she boarded the plane and she left and and I had no contact with her except for an occasional maybe email or something and and I longed to see her I missed her so bad I just wanted to hear her voice I wanted to smell her perfume I wanted to see her
while she was gone, I was also nervous. I was like, what if, what if she changes her mind? What if she doesn't feel the same way about me when she gets back? And so I, I, I seized every moment I could. I, I, I clung to the promises and the conversations and the memories that we had as proof that she was the one. And while she was gone, I had a ring made, and she called me when she got back into the States and said, hey, tomorrow I'm going to be flying into Charlotte. I'm going to be arriving in the airport at this time. And, and so after we hung up, I made all the preparations to go to the airport. I, I got some flowers, and I made a, a big sign that said, will you marry me? And, and so I went down to the airport and ahead of time, and, and as she's coming down the the causeway there my heart began to race and I was so excited for this moment and and I had I had this plan and in my head of what was going to happen and and so Katie comes through security and I get down on one knee and I I ask her to marry me see in that moment I, there's a lot of things I could have done I I could have I could have written a letter I could have sent a card I, I could have asked Bobby or Lowell to go down there but but see, this was forever, man. This was, this was the one. This was the one that I wanted to spend my life with. And, and it was too important to send somebody else. I had to go myself. She needed to hear it from me that I loved her and I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. And as the band comes up, I want to close with this thought. After John opens reminding the children of Israel of all the promises, all the poems, all the letters, all the words that have been spoken. He says this, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. At the end of the Old Testament, God had been silent for several hundred years and and the religious leaders and the people longed to hear from their beloved. And in God's final act to prove that he was the one true God, the lover of our souls, he did what only he could do. Our eternity, our salvation was too important. He had to come himself. He didn't send a prophet. He didn't tell another story. He didn't write another letter. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And we beheld His glory. We celebrate Christmas because there is no silence the one that we've been waiting for, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the Christ. The Word became flesh. And He stepped into our reality. And He humbled Himself before us. And He revealed Himself to us. And we have the privilege of knowing the lover of our souls. The one that created us to love and to be loved by him. And if you're here today and you've never received that gift, if you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to receive that gift, I invite you in this moment to receive the greatest Christmas gift you have ever received and will ever receive. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and repeat after me. And I want you to know that there's nothing specific about these words. That they are simply an inward reflection coming out of us, out of our mouths, declaring that we are God's people in need of a Christ. And that when you and I do that, we are forever changed so if everyone would bow their heads and 
Again, if you've never received this, I just ask you to repeat these words after me. Father God, you are the king of kings. You are the creator and the sustainer of all things. And because you are the lover of our souls, you stepped in to time and space in the form of your son, Jesus Christ, to reveal your love for us. And you invite us to receive the free gift of knowing you And in doing so, Holy Spirit, we ask you to change us from the inside out. That we recognize that we are a sinful people and that we need a good and holy God. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the family. We celebrate Christmas with you. We celebrate the birth of the one and only, the King of Kings, the Christ, the Messiah, the beginning and the end, the Word that became flesh. Merry Christmas.